forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe of society. The candles are lit. The lights are down low. And it is now time for our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight. For the midnight. For lack. Ghastly greetings to all of my groovy ghoulies and welcome to the Midnight Black Mass. We're back after a little brief break for the holidays. I hope to be joining you with more vim and vigor today, but uh, just got back from Anarchy Wrestling Season's beatings. It was a hell of a night, and unfortunately, I injured myself. Not on anything I did in the ring. Believe it or not, it was not even the giant high five where I got the the biggest vertical I'd ever gotten in my career uh, trying to high five Michael Judas in the ring after our match, but uh, the car ride, I did something in the car. Um, all the, the workers know it's every now and again, you hit that long road trip, especially if you hadn't done one in a while. And, uh, the way this one worked out, man, I, I really fucked something up in my back. So I've been somewhat paralyzed today, but still, uh, I owe it to you people, my dedicated listeners to get another edition of this podcast out. So thanks for joining us. Uh, of course, Reverend Dan Wilson here, if you didn't know, but if you're subscribing to this show, I suspect you do. Uh, thank you for all the support you've given us in 2014. This is our year-end edition of the program. Our guest tonight is uh, another recap of part two of Bill Barron's in the history of NWA Wildside. It's going to be a long one. I'll also, just like part one, going to run about two hours. Very few people have heard this interview in its entirety. Uh, bits and pieces of it have been played places. Um, it was fairly popular when it first debuted, but our listenership was barely a tenth of what it is now. So uh, definitely happy to be bringing this to you again. And so much information. I figured with the end of the Franklin Dove era at Anarchy Wrestling that it was only fitting to have Bill on. Uh, and and replay this just to in honor of all the history of that arena. So we found out a lot. We found out, of course, that uh, Anarchy Wrestling will continue. That uh, gentleman named Charles Anschutz purchased the company at the last minute. He came in and uh, wrestling will continue. Looks like Bill Barons is going to continue in his vaunted head of creative position there. It's like Todd Sexton's going to continue as well. So, um, that's great for everyone involved there. Apparently, Mr. Anschutz has uh, had a fairly successful promotion with his Southern Fried Championship Wrestling. He seems to understand what he's got with Anarchy and the reputation that it has and, and what he needs to do to try to take it to the next level. And that ain't going to be easy without spending some cash, but he appears he's going to do that. So um, very exciting, promising future, actually, now for Anarchy Wrestling. And glad they kept the doors open. I think as long as you've got Bill Barron's in charge down there, you don't have anything to worry about, regardless of who's paying the bills. Um, if they're listening to him and deferring to him in judgment and making sure they're doing their job on the promotional end, which he's admittedly, as you'll hear in this interview, not the best at, uh, but his other strengths are so voluminous that you you just have to have him in that spot. It's just, it, it would be, I don't know, it'd be like peanut butter without jelly, having anarchy wrestling without Bill Barron. So uh, just all, all good news coming out of that other than the back injury, which I'll get over that in a couple of days, but, um, I'm not as, as peppy as I normally would be here on the program. Um, just looking at the year in review, 2014, honestly was a difficult year. It was not a bad year, but it was difficult. Um, but that was due to many circumstances outside of my control. We just, a lot of uh, sickness and death in our family and um, just unfortunate circumstances occurred. A lot of bad luck uh, with vehicles and other things. And that part of it was, it, it was just, it made it difficult, but I'd, I'd be 
personally, I think I'd be ungrateful if I said it was a bad year because it was not a bad year. So many good things happened in 2014, and that's what I'm focusing on here tonight on the show. Just very briefly, as I get this opening segment out of the way to get you to our featured content, um, 2014, the good, so much of it. Um, had a lot of fun as a parent, first of all. Uh, you know, as your kid starts getting into those toddler ages where they can communicate with you better and understand what's going on better, it's a whole lot more fun. I uh, even enjoyed a trip to Disney on ice, among other great family activities that I engaged in this year. And um, that was a personal highlight. Also, uh, just on a personal level, I went to Heroes Con in Charlotte, North Carolina with my best friend, the great Muji, and uh, the co-founder of the Potty Humor Network. And we had a great time there. We did a big review on our comic show, Get Your Pulls, which is also here on the Potty Humor Network at youtube.com slash potty humor. Attended Dragon Con, as I do annually, both as a performer and as a fan. Uh, which is always a nice deal because you get paid to be there as a performer. And then you can also attend it for free as a fan, which is nice. Actually getting paid to attend it as a fan. So that's a good thing. Uh, and then, of course, in concert, I had, had plenty of experiences there. I saw Kiss, Def Leppard, Steel Panther, Boston, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, Unknown Henson. And, of course, topped it off with the legendary and almighty metal gods, Judas fucking Priest. In Atlanta, Georgia, one of the greatest concerts I've ever seen. Uh, just, you know, the older you get, the more you reflect and the more you appreciate these moments because they're not going to be around forever. And really, what is life but a collection of good and bad moments? And so uh, you got to keep those good moments with you. And, and all those concert experiences with all of my dear friends certainly were that. Uh, but Judas Priest, of course, uh, hard to top that. So no need for another concert in 2014 because the last one I saw was Judas Priest and nothing's going to beat that. So uh, it, it was a great year in that respect. We had a lot of highlights here professionally, both on the Midnight Black Mass radio show, as well as Get Your Pulls. We had some big time guests this year. We had AJ Styles. We had Matt Seidel. We had Les Thatcher. Um, we got more coming. We had Air Paris. Uh, and, and more coming in 2015. We've got the legendary Pat Rose coming up. We've got Air Paris Part 2 coming up. Also, a couple of other big announcements, thanks to Air Paris, that we've got coming once we finalize the dates. Very excited about those. And, of course, our partnership with the Beyond Ringside Radio Network happened in 2014. They've been very kind to the show, drawn a whole host, a slew of new listeners to the Midnight Black Mass program over at beyondringside.com. And uh, we really appreciate them and all of their efforts to promote us and to plug us and to keep us floating and out there and, and getting into new ear holes, so to speak. So uh, big thanks to BeyondRingside.com, to Fast Eddie Lane, and all of them, uh, Wicked Nemesis and that whole crew, for really being kind to the Midnight Black Mass and being a great friend to the Potty Humor family. Uh, of course, this Volume 5 will continue into 2015 um just because it's so solely based off of wrestling we're just going to keep volume five rolling until i decide to take it in a different direction um and you know at that time you'll know but right now volume five continues and it continues unabated this week of course with the bill barons part two of the history of nwa wild side of course as a manager that's been what i've known for for many years uh, but also Filled back in the old shoes this year and actually got back into the announcing booth. And that was quite enjoyable and uh, proved that I still had it, I think, <laughs> without a shadow of a doubt. Maybe you can you can let me know. Go over to EmpireWrestling.net to see some of my most recent play-by-play -play work with the Empire Wrestling crew. Maybe, maybe you can make that decision, but I was happy with the effort that I turned out, especially given the concerns I had for rustiness. And certainly there was a little bit of that there, but uh, far less than I expected and, and very happy to be back in the announce booth for Empire Wrestling. But also did plenty of managerial work, of course, at Dragon Con Championship Wrestling, as I previously mentioned. I uh, also appeared for Platinum Championship Wrestling, Deep Southern Championship Wrestling, the Allied Independent Wrestling Federations, uh, Total Wrestling Entertainment, Superstars Wrestling Fan Fest 2 on iPay-Per-View, and I topped it off with the set appearance at NWA Anarchy, or rather, I'm sorry, I 
<laughs> it's second nature, and I'm never going to stop saying NWA before that. So I apologize for having to correct myself on each and every edition of the Midnight Black Mass. But Anarchy Wrestling, final show under the promoter Franklin Dove. Uh, there was a lot of question as to the future of the company. As I'd mentioned earlier, there was uh, a new man purchased it and uh, is actually a fan of the show. So we appreciated that. <laughs> But uh, seemed like a good guy, and like I said, if uh, if Bill and the management there are happy with the way things are going, I I didn't know enough about the situation to comment. But if he's happy, I'm happy, so I think that's great, and uh, and he's going to be moving forward. But last night, the goodbye to Franklin Dove was a fun one. It's uh, at least made me have one annual appearance there. It's the only time I appeared there in 2014, uh, but at least keeps me going. Since the year 2000, I've appeared in Cornelia, Georgia for the NWA Wildside, NWA Anarchy, and now Anarchy Wrestling since the year 2000. Uh, many times as a regular every show type of guy, but for the last few years, I've just been coming in as a guest. So you can just call me Rough House Fargo because, you know, if the holidays are around, the Reverend's going to be popping in Cornelia. At least that's the way history would lead you to believe. Uh, but. Very cool, very cool event, very cool night. Uh, congrats to Strick9 and Azriel on continuing the Devil's Rejects legacy into 2015. My eighth tag team championship that I've managed. Uh, they won the NW or they won the Anarchy Tag Team Championship in a three way against the Big F and Deal and William Huckabee and Joe Black. And they will continue the Rejects legacy into 2015. 2015 marks the 10th year anniversary of the devil's rejects. So strict nine and Asriel rechristening themselves, uh, bringing back the rejects name and the rejects attitude. And they're going to continue that into 2015. And Hey, you never know. I, I'm going to be managing them just from afar. So if they ever need dire assistance down there, I'm only a phone call away. You never know when I might show up at anarchy in 2015. Uh, also, you never know where I might show up else otherwise in 2015. Already got dates for Empire Wrestling on January 23rd, January 24th. I'll be there. Also, uh, got several dates on the books for Deep Southern Championship Wrestling. And they keep coming in. Not bad for a guy who considers himself in semi-retirement. But um, I can at least pick and choose what I want to do and keep it kind of limited and try to balance that family life, which is so important to me. But uh, in any event, the other big highlight I wanted to talk about from season's beatings was getting to manage Pomp and Circumstance and the Priest of Punishment, Michael Judas. It's the first time I'd ever gotten to manage Judas, even though with our respective gimmicks and personas, it would seem that we would have been paired together long beforehand, but it just never worked out. Uh, but it did last night, and it was a whole lot of fun. And then, of course, Pomp and Circumstance are the seven-figure deal Ace Rockwell and the Temptation Sean Tempers. Uh, they've been tag team partners and bitter rivals over the years, but here at the holidays, they were able to put their differences aside, reunite the old team. Uh, those are two guys I actually helped break into the business. I've known them for the entirety of my 15 years in the sport of professional wrestling. They are, uh, in many ways, my children uh, or my little brothers. Um, I live and die through those guys. They've made me very proud over the years. They've disappointed me over the years, but um, that's only humanity. You know, that's going to happen. Last night, they made me as proud as anyone. Uh, the only other time I've ever managed Pomp and Circumstance was in a tag team match. One off show in like Chatsworth, Georgia or Dalton. It was one of those small towns in like the northwest Georgia area. But we it was me in the corner of Pomp and Circumstance against the nightmare Ted Allen. Rest his soul. And Kyle Matthews in a hell of a match. It was the only other time. I've ever managed Pomp and Circumstance, despite being heavily involved in their careers, both from day one. So that was a very cool moment, very special for me, and uh, wrapped up what was a hell of a season's beatings card. So go check them out at anarchywrestling.net. Glad to see that they're moving forward. We're going to get right back to you after these commercial breaks with the Bill Barron's History of NWA Wildside Part 2. And I'm going to go look for some ice to put on my back and try to pass out. So thank you for joining the show. We'll be right back after the commercial with our featured interview. We'll see you next week on the Midnight Black Mass.
Whether you're having an autograph session, personal appearance, or live event, we got just the person you need to contact for all of those needs. SBI Bookings is home of some of the best stars in the wrestling industry today. They provide you with the best talent this business has to offer, from Kevin Nash, Larry Zbysko, Scott Steiner, and many, many more. So who will you contact next time you're planning an event? The men of SBI Bookings. Check them out at sbibookings.com. Hi, but not too high. This is George Carlin. I'm sitting here. I have on a yellow hat, a pink shirt, dark sunglasses, and an earring in my ear. And I'm going to tell you not to get into heavy drugs. Well, it sounds bizarre, I know, but there are other things to do with your life, other things to help you make it. Heavy drugs make it all worse, and they help you die. Wrestling fans, Anarchy Wrestling Television tapings are the second and fourth Saturdays of every month at 4236 Level Grove Road in Cornelia, Georgia. For more information on Anarchy Wrestling and on the shows to watch the television product and a whole lot more, go to anarchy-wrestling.net. That's Anarchy Wrestling, the second and fourth Saturdays of every month in Cornelia, Georgia. And welcome to another edition of the NWA Wildside Chronicles here on the Midnight Black Mass, courtesy of PottyHumor.com. This is part four of our interview series with NWA Wildside founder and promoter, Mr. Bill Behrens. Tonight, we're discussing the year of 2002 and 2003. Bill Behrens, welcome to the program. Great to have you back again. And nice to be back. And uh, now we're finally up to the year I kept trying to discuss last time. So pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I, <laughs> you really you, like everyone desperately wanted me to talk about 2001, and by gosh, I wanted to get to 2002, didn't I? <laughs> you, you really liked that year. And, and to your uh, credit, something it was something about great 2002. Year. Was, I mean, 2001 was a good year. We, you know, we, we had always been doing the junior stuff, but we really started – focusing more on that and having more what would be called main event matches that were geared around some of the smaller guys. And that sort of came initially at the strongest level in 2001, but it sort of set the plate for, I don't know whether you, what you call it, but maybe you can call it an invasion, but it also established the reputation at some level on an, on an indie level about that we were doing something different, that we were a place to be. And, Although we had a lot of big people eventually come, the influx that was greatest were with some of the smaller talent and guys that, you know, were becoming indie darlings in various other places and remain, in many cases, indie darlings or people who have gone on to bigger and better things. Yeah. And we were sort of at the, the, the cutting edge of that going into at the end of 2001 and going into 2002, the floodgates sort of opened. And we had AJ Styles with one of his only reigns as Wildside Champion. We briefly discussed that last time, but coming into 2002, he was the champion, and the big feud was actually a three-way entanglement at the top of the cards between AJ, his trainer Rick Michaels, and his respected adversary, the Messiah of the Spinebuster, David Young, who had just had a very bitter falling out with Michael, so all of that culminated in the main event of a two-part extravaganza that was Hardcore Hell 2002, and that occurred in March, on March 23rd of 2002. Thoughts about that feud, how it came to be, and did you kind of roll with it as things were happening to make that what it was, or was it always the plan from the beginning to have those three end up in the ring at Hardcore Hell? Uh, honestly, I don't remember that well. I know we, we initially just had the feud going into Christmas Chaos the previous year was, was Rick Michaels and AJ. Um, and we had, uh, for reasons unknown, AJ had always been a major focus in the company, but he quite literally, other than uh, the TV title, had been right, relatively title-free. In fact, um, he was the guy most people beat to get a title as it turned out. I mean, uh, a junior title won by J.C. Daz was, you know, beating A.J. Um, so A.J., while one of our top stars, was more, was very frequently a go-to guy, and even though he was one of our top stars, uh, we ended up 
really only putting the title on him. He only had a reign of maybe three, maybe four months. Um, we went into, I think we added David for a combination of reasons, not the least of which is that uh, Allen likes wor- liked working David, and at the time, um, David had been on the road for quite a while off and on with, with Rick Michaels and, and wanted to at various times kill Rick. So I think AJ and AJ had started traveling to some indie things with David um, on his own and, and got to the point where they were pretty tight at the time. And I think AJ wanted to get involved in that. And as we spun forward, what was a three person feud going into hardcore hell sort of modified into a lot more of AJ and David uh, after that, which eventually led to a match we first did in our arena uh, where they went Broadway and then did another five minutes and went crazy all over the building that they then did in Nashville following, and that became their TNA audition and led to both of them being among the first hired, if not the first hired, by TNA. Simultaneous with that, AJ had been offered a development deal by WWE uh, to go up to what was then a development area Les Thatcher was running, and um, had a tough decision. That's a, that's probably, again, one of the other reasons we had to um, make AJ's reign a little shorter than we might have. But I, I think quite, if my memory is correct, we had already really made the decision to get the title off of him well before TNA became a factor. Yes, yes, that that was uh, going down at that point. And then I'm looking here at the result. I was able to think to obsess with wrestling.com, who uh, – did a very thorough recap of 2002 on their website. I'm checking out the results here, and it looks like um, got some more of AJ and Jason Cross after the hardcore hell. That's kind of where he went and then was in an eight-man here and there. Um, didn't see a lot of AJ after that here in, in Wild Side. We, always, and then we had a tendency kinda... to always put Jason and AJ together because it was always a good feud, but um... – and I don't remember the timing of this, but this could have been right around the time, again, we were grooming Jason to potentially be a champion, only to have him fall off the radar again. Um, it was. All this happened right here. I see it right in front of my eyes. So, yeah, you're right on and, track. Um, and then, of course, the next time, and I'm, I'm going to forget, but I think it was at the end of 2002, we got Jason back eventually, but we brought him back. Uh, if memory serves, that's when he came back as the green guy, um, which – remain well, many people's favorite angle we did that sort of started as a joke and we never thought it would get over and then it had a life of its own and it's amazing the quantity of drive-in people who became green guys as we would flood the arena with uh, guys wearing green masks uh, sort of a sort of a neat little angle and we actually had people convinced that jason with a body um was air paris <laughs> which, which never made any sense at all. Because, but, but for some reason, we were able to get because Jason went out and did a couple of Air Paris things, and the crowd actually thought the green guy was Air Paris for most of the run until we did the the unveil. Yeah, speaking of that, I, I'm just looking at the results. There was Jeremy Vane made an appearance as a green guy at one point. I'm seeing here. Um, there were a lot. Kenny of, Kenny uh, Doan Kenny Doan was a green guy if memory serves. Um, yes, he was. You know, we we had an awful lot of guys that came in to do green guy spots, and uh, and and again, uh, we also had a lot of uh, transition. We had we had acquired, um, I guess, what we could say, the godfather of the junior division, uh, either at the end of 2001, early part of 2002. Uh, Tony Mamaluke came to us, and at the same time, that brought Jerlo in, uh, Jeremy Lopez. And Mamaluke became sort of the trainer for all of our juniors, and Lopez became the long-running go-to champion as a heel and uh, and really provided us, I thought, with a lot of good stability, particularly as we brought in and uh, so many people from the outside and began doing, because so many people would come in, we began doing these cluster matches all the time. Everything seemed to be a four-person, five-person elimination match every time people came in. Um, but that, that was, that's my, re- my memory of how things uh, went. We, the Briscoe brothers came in, the backseat boys came in. This is all through, or at the end of the year, we started getting a, just a horde of people. And I, I you know, you get all the way to Fright Night, uh, in November, uh, where, where we did, uh, a, a fairly spec, uh, we did a, a tag team gimmick on that one. We had we had people from all over the frickin' place on that. We had Adam Windsor and Dory Funk Jr. as a team. The Briscoes were in. 
We had uh, TNT, the Backseat Boys, Scotty Rand and, and Tank were in that. Uh, and then, you know, some just throwaway teams, although not bad ones, uh, Sex, Love, and Money, uh, Dagen Briggs and J.C. North, you know. Uh, Lost Boys were together in that thing. We still had the Dobbins Brothers, which was entertaining. Total Destruction was in. Those were our big boys. Um, but we, could just, we had all these Mind and Matter, Dr. Heresy and Brian Black from New England, it was just, you know, it was just a tremendous group. Blackout had been put together, which originally started as the Usual Suspects, but uh, and Caprice yeah. Coleman was originally part of it. How things came full circle there. Speaking of Blackout, yeah, we tried uh, Caprice Coleman out. If I remember, we tried Caprice Coleman out with Laz, and we ended up taking Laz before we took Caprice, which is, you know, not that Laz wasn't an exceptional character for us, and we did some awesome things with Laz. Uh, and eventually, um, Laz sort of began morphing himself through through some chemistry, I think, and and began looking just weird. Um, and that's when he became Dustin Timberlake for a brief period of time. Yeah, um, that was in two, and that was sort of the phase out point. But Caprice came in originally, and we didn't see as much in him as we did in Laz, which was sort of odd. And then, of course, Caprice became one of the the foundations. Um, for our company, and, and only now, you know, uh, as we, we record this, is only now starting to get uh, the kind of credibility he deserves uh, at Ring of Honor, which one would have thought would have happened ages ago, given his talent. Yeah, it, it's been a long haul for him, and he's worked really hard, so I am glad to see that he's finally getting some recognition. Um, and speaking of a blackout, 2002, you really saw the early part of 02 was them dominating as a tag team, but as the year progressed, especially getting later on into the year and into 2003, you started to see them go into their separate ways. And uh, both of them had great singles runs, but in particular, Rain Man, Corey Chavis, um, had an amazing run, a great feud with Rick Michaels that really put him over the top. Um, and, and it was just great to see those guys blossom off and carry the company from there as well. Yeah, Murder, Murder sort of vanished for a little bit. He uh, was booking another promotion, if memory serves. Um, uh, somebody had come up with, some, so I think, Grandma's Money, and he ended up booking that and leaving us for a period of time around that time, and it gave Rain Man really an opportunity to step up. Uh, and, and by golly, he did. And, you know, of course, that continues now with him being one half of the world tag team champions, where, which multiple time world tag team champions. Yeah, absolutely. So is, but we, we also were periodically, and, and, you know, again, I go back in 2002 and at the end of 2001, the focus again became a little bit on the younger ones. And part of that also had to do with the fact that Jimmy Rave became a world junior champion and we would then bring in the various world junior champions and position a lot of our drive-in people around that, whether it was Jarrell Clark down the line or, you know, even in 2002 at Freedom Fight, we had Rocky Reynolds in, who at that point was, was a viable contender for that title. Uh, TNT had emerged as a viable tag team, Todd Sexton and Tony Stradlin, uh, skinnier versions uh, of at least one half of that group for sure. And we did the uh, either the first or the second, depending on point of view, Briscoe versus Briscoe match that year. Yes, and like, it's so coincidental that you mentioned all of those things because they all occurred on June 29th, 2002, between between 225 and 250 fans, according to this report, um, at Freedom Fight 2002, which is one of my absolute most favorite events in the whole Wild Side catalog. There's a lot of emotion in that main event. That was where... It was where Murder One had left, and Jason Cross had also left. So our War Games match got flushed down the shitter, and you came up with this eight-man Holy Wars elimination match, and it ended up being one of the greatest fucking things we'd ever done. And and we put over the littlest guy, um, and the guy that did it again, uh, the go-to guy, bless his heart, AJ. Um, we got all the way down to Adam Jacobs and AJ. And uh, but the whole storytelling of that really, really flowed well. I thought um, there was blood because it was a cage, but by the end of it, the wrestling was dominating, not the gore. Uh, it was one of those uh, well laid out things, I think, where we got the storyline feud stuff out early. And then we got it down to pure wrestling at the end for the heavyweight title rather than team versus team, which had been 
before that and thereafter always what we did with the War Games gimmick, which uh, we we adopted and embraced. Uh, Dusty Rhodes obviously created and, and actually participated in with us at least one time. But we always found a, a real love for that particular event. And there was a disappointment in this one when we lost both Jason and Murder because it it really screwed up our ability to create teams at that point based on everything else we had planned because everybody else was married to somebody. You know, we had all this other stuff going on, um, you know, and, and we really didn't have anybody else to pull in that made any sense. So the only thing that made sense was to do the eight man single elimination deal and do it and do it progressive and tell a good story with it. To some minor extent, it almost became, uh, although you, everything was a single elimination, it, it sort of, uh, was an offshoot of the my fondness for the Mega Rumble, uh, which specifically is the ability to tell multiple stories within a cluster of a match. And and we did that really well, I thought, in that particular match. And the guys all stepped up and did really well in their spots. Everybody worked really hard in that match. I don't nobody dogged that one. That that one was a shine match for everybody. Yeah, and it was also the first time Iceberg had been taken off of his feet as part of that storytelling. Iceberg had just dominated 2002. He came aboard in late 2001, slaughtered, just build up perfectly, slaughtering underneath talent, and then eventually Didn't he do, a, didn't he do something off the second rope or the top rope? Was it, was it David that, that, that spinebustered him? Yes, David Young gave him a spine buster off the second turnbuckle to the uh, going to the ring inside the cage, and that was the first time he'd been pinned, and I believe the first time he'd been taken off of his feet during that run. Uh, and that was well, such and that's a huge one of the moment. things to, to pat us on the back a little bit in terms of, again, you know, when I when I worked for WWE, John Laurinaitis growled to me, "You're known for developing small people," and I said, "Yeah, well, yeah, like, except for all the big ones." Um, one of the things we taught everybody that came in that was big was you don't go off your feet easily. And almost all of our big guys were so generous, uh, even if they had enjoyed a beverage, all of them were very willing to bump for a flea. Um, Berg, you know, Berg was that guy. Um, uh, Abyss, bless his heart, was that guy. Hernandez you know, was a little a little easier, but Hernandez wanted to fly like a cruiserweight. I mean, he, he thought he was a cruiserweight in terms of the spot. And then we were able to ground everybody and made the big guys big, and so they stood out. And so when we took somebody off their feet, it was a big deal. Um, and it usually led to a big reaction, and that because we had – I've always believed that in the presence of smaller people – big guys are bigger and more relevant, and you can do more. One of the problems WWE is having right now that um, Canyon Seaman, who's the new talent guy that was brought in, of course, coming out of volleyball, which is, of course, the natural transition into acquiring uh, professional wrestlers, he, um, you know, he said, uh, I'm, I'm charged with finding big people because we have all these guys in development that are six, six foot two, and 225 pounds. And my comment would be, what about smaller people so your six, six foot two, 225 pound guys are bigger? Then your big guys are huge and you can do more, you know, or is it better just to put Ryback out there and have him kill two small guys each time to prove he's big? You know, we, we did those kind of things, too. But we also allowed the little guys to be credible with the big guys. And, you know, Slim J rapidly became that guy. Uh, the guy that could take on anybody. And he wasn't doing as much of that in 2001 into 2002, but in bear, inevitably, and it was probably around the time a, a year or two after that when we teamed him with Murder One for a run, that Slim became the guy that could, you know, go toe-to-toe with anybody. And we began to identify that small guys can be viable in the ring with big guys and, and everybody, and it can be very believable. And, and interesting that you mentioned Slim, just looking down at the results of the card. Um, Slim J had his breakout match to date at that point in his career, also on this card, defeating Jeremy, Jeremy v. v. With the spot with doing a spot that I vetoed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a spot I told them we they were not allowed were to dead. do, that it was too dangerous and somebody was going to get hurt, and they did it anyway. And that would be fans for the uninitiated following us at home. Um, Slim J had slammed Jeremy on the ramp and 
went into the ring to the top turnbuckle and dove what was supposed to be a splash, but was so far away by proxy ended up becoming a diving headbutt. Uh, it was pretty dangerous. And they lived. Um <laughs> But it was a spectacular spot, and they were determined. Uh, and that was, again, another thing. Whether I wanted it or not, I, I've always, uh, uh, and, and anybody who's worked with me knows, I've tried to veto or vetoed more stuff than most promoters would. Most of the time when wrestlers go, hey, I want to kill myself tonight, the promoter goes, cool. Um, I'm usually the opposite of that, and, and I, I because I actually do care and I want these guys to wake up in the morning. Um, I try to veto things all the time or try to rethink a way to do other things. But as our reputation began growing um, more and more, the kids wanted to do more and reining everybody in became a little bit more difficult over time um, because so everybody wanted to have that memorable moment on the card. And you look at that, that freedom fight card and there are a ton of memorable moments on that card. Um, you know, I go back to the Briscoe match. The Briscoes did a tremendous series of near falls near the end of their match that were totally believable. Um, and uh, the call on the match that you did was, was tremendous. I mean, it was just, was one of those great matches and it'll hold up against any match they've done to date. And it was one of their earliest ones, but there was psychology. It wasn't kicking out of everything under the sun. It all made sense. And it was just a beautifully executed match. And, and that was the kind of show that thing was. There was a, an awful lot of really good storytelling all the way through it. And very little that, that sucked. Yeah. Uh, that, that Briscoe versus Briscoe match, Mark versus Jay brothers who are very popular in ring of honor now fans. Uh, but also at this time we're, young budding talents that were trying to get out and get their name known, and they wanted to come to Georgia. They made their first appearance appearance in October of 2001 against the Lost Boys, actually. Uh, they came back in to do a match against each other at this Freedom Fight card, and the fans were so dead when they first came out there because they just the wild side crowd wasn't really used to seeing two twin brothers wrestling babyface versus babyface, but it was so good. They had those people on their feet by the time it was over with every day. Yeah, it's just a totally brilliant match uh, all the way through, and and um, they uh, they continue to be, but at that time, you know, uh, to, you know, other, uh, you know, of course, the you know, after the match, the boys all played, and they were some of the hardest players. But in their earliest appearances, they, they, they came down in the family truckster with mom and dad. The entire Pew family loaded up the car and brought them down. It was that kind of family. Um, and so they fit right in because Wildside was always a family. Um, it wasn't just a wrestling show. Uh, and, and, again, that separated it. Um, if you came in and you worked for us, you knew you weren't going to get a lot of money. Um, you knew there was going to be some exposure. Uh, and there was hopefully a learning process, and some people embraced it wholeheartedly and quickly became part of the family. And the other people, it totally confused them, and because it wasn't the standard show, it wasn't where you just show up and hey, you know, shake hands, say hey, brother, and collect your payday and go home. And the guys that skewed toward the latter were rarely back, and usually went home and said nasty things. But the bulk of the people that came in found it to be a place where they could be creative and where they could be special. And and so they kept wanting to come back. Yeah, it really was. If you cared about leaving some sort of legacy in in this business besides, you know, just wrestling on some outlaw shows here and there, then you wanted to sink your creative teeth into wild side because you would get to do something that you loved and do it well and be a part of something. That at least the people watching it on television at the time and the people in the attendance will remember. You know, maybe nobody else will, but it's something. It's a contribution to the universe. Yeah. Oh, and also at this time, one of my favorite tag teams ever was together, and that would be uh, G-rated. Uh, I always had fun with um, – uh, Sal and secondarily with Seth, who seemed to be associated with Sal off and on, even though they feuded off and on also, they always seemed to go back together. 
Uh, they became guys that totally ruled down the line, but they were G-rated back during this time until near the end of 2002. They actually started feuding each other for their first time um, in a real feud. But uh, G-rated was just one of my favorite things. And, and going into, I mean, 2001, they had just pure nonsense with that team, with them taking on the biggest guys as if they could. You know, uh, let's see, what was it? David Not So Young and Terry Old, and Terry Old as Night, uh, the new bad attitude at the end of 2001, was one of their matches where they came out with, um, I think it was Seth with a Superman outfit being carried by Sal, if I remember which one was which in that particular spot. Just total nonsense. The promos were all ridiculous. Of course, the G standard for good, stood for good looking. And uh, and they were uh, periodically, as anyone who's been to Wildside knows, periodically there are things that I do that simply entertain me. And G-rated entertained me. And then eventually, uh, and I don't remember what I did. I think it, it happened in 2003, but it might have been at the end of 2002, but it's probably 2003 where Sal Renaro uh, was dropped on his head and actually became a Spanish guy. So, um, <laughs> Sal Del Rio, yes. Oh my yeah, God. Sal, Del, Sal Del Rio, who could only say one thing in English, and that phrase was, I will make your panties moist. That was the only English phrase he knew how to say. And uh, and eventually we, we he was he came out of his um, his concussion. We were into concussion issues well before the before the curve. Uh, when he came out of his concussion, it was in a vignette that was reminiscent of The Wizard of Oz where he woke up and six months had passed. And he's sitting there and he goes, you know, I'm home. And I remember, and, and you were there, and you were there, and I have no idea who you are. <laughs> yeah, because there, there were new people. So yeah, always entertaining and, and, uh, stuff with, 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 uh, with Sal and with Seth and with the other guys that totally ruled that uh, – we had over the years, many of whom were ranked by PWI this year in the uh, PWI 500. Yeah, we had a great showing this year as far as our uh, group of talent, but not to get off on that tangent too much. As we've got about 15 minutes left here on the recording time. Uh, but, but yeah, during the time we were also, I mean, I mentioned we we were focusing, and if you look at our cards, you saw a lot of smaller people. You saw, you know, going into Christmas Chaos, we had Jason Cross and John Phoenix. John Phoenix had come back. Um, and there was a feud between form, former suicidal tendencies members at various times. But we also had Iceberg versus Stone Mountain. Stoney had been gone for a bit and had come back. Um, so we had two, two of the biggest guys we ever had in play. AJ was working David Young at the time, and that was still going, even though at the time both were already um, working in TNA. Uh, Todd and uh, Todd Sexton and Tony Stradlin had, had broken up and were feuding. The Lost Boys were with a, a team we called Future Shock. Rain Man was the single you talked about with Tony Mameluke. Slimmy was still married to Jeremy V. And you know, and then we had Dory Funkin again. Crew Jones was there. Murder Murder had come back, and actually Rain Man was accompanying him, but they were only loosely associated. Really, we saw the Dobbins brothers and Scotty Ren and Tank were in something with them. Sal was with Kid Cool and. As always, we would find a place for New Jack, um, who became one of the uh, one of the constants in the history of Wildside. Sort of the yin to our yang. Uh, I adopted Jack uh, a few years prior to that, and and Jack adopted us. And we were one of the rare places. Uh, we're not saying we didn't have incidents with Jack, but we were one of the places where Jack was relatively normal. Um, and everybody used to talk about, you know, always oh, a problem and always, but we always had a wonderful time with new Jack. We, his interviews were thoroughly entertaining. He could go out and we rarely had him work in the arena. We'd have him talk. And every time he, he grabbed the mic, it was magic. It, and whenever he retired, he'd make sure he came back and he unretired with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that actually was the Christmas chaos 2002 where he came and, and did that, and um, uh, that then that would round out 2002. Now, going into 2003, sort of see the emergence of the Texas crew. Uh, Rudy Boy Gonzalez had been bringing a class of guys with three that really stood out in the early goings, one of those being Hot Stuff Hernandez, as you'd mentioned, and also Fast Eddie and Masada were part of that crew, and I'm noticing here as we go into 2003, that they started becoming more regular parts of the card. Although I have to admit my, my sympathetic favorites were probably the Texas treats. Um, 
Don Juan and Chris Marvel. Uh, Don Juan uh, always enter- – again, sometimes some things just entertain me and there's no explanation for it. I was the guy that enjoyed Manchild. So there, you know, there's always something that entertains me, and, and therefore everybody else has to endure it. But, it. but this was one of those where I think everybody got entertained. Um, and the Texas treats were, the, were very stable with us once they came in. But we had a good group. I mean, uh, Lance Hoyt came in and did some of his early stuff during that same period with us and, um, and was just this big, gigantic green guy that uh, came on a couple of shows. But Rudy would load up the family truckster charge the guys to drive them up here and usually about three shows in they would i'd get pulled aside by a texas guy going um so and so a previous texas guy says that we can just come here and i go yeah you mean we don't have to pay rudy no (laughs) so i didn't mean to screw rudy's gimmick but uh periodically uh Rudy, Rudy kept coming, but he had to keep finding new people to uh, to you know to hop in the family truckster because everybody else started coming on their own after a while. <laughs> and Rapid Edward broke out as one of our top juniors. Uh, nothing with you know, which which certainly we saw coming, but probably he didn't. By yes, that is a vision joke. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, Fast Eddie, for those of those who don't know, uh, is is actually blind legally. So all the more impressive that he was a fucking fantastic wrestler uh, because he literally couldn't see in front of his face. But you know who else had come in and and really didn't break out at Wildside but has turned out to be a considerable talent is we had, in essence, a comedy heel team that had debuted called the Elite Swingers. That, that sort of struggled in. Um, a one guy jumped out immediately, and that was he was calling himself Michael Adrian. But their whole gimmick was fueled by a little skinny guy named Scotty Smooth, who did most of the talking. Michael Adrian just stood there. There was a Vincent I. Payne guy who was with them for a while until he tried a spot on the short side of the ring and broke his leg. And he left. And for whatever reason, we had a terrible time getting Michael Adrian out of being an elite swinger and disassociating himself with those guys. Um, and, and, and quite honestly, we really didn't accomplish that until like 2004, where we finally got him associated loosely with the NWA elite. But it was obvious to all of us looking at him that, you know, Michael Adrian, now Michael Judas, was going to be one of those guys. But Unlike Iceberg, unlike Stone Mountain, unlike Hernandez, unlike uh, Abyss as Justice, it took him a whole lot longer to convince him to be a big guy. We had to work much harder with him. But by golly, once he crossed that and going to Puerto Rico sort of sealed the deal, uh, which didn't happen until he was uh, all the way after Wildside once Anarchy got started, or actually several years into Anarchy. But uh, he's now he's now become one of the best working big men in the business, uh, no matter what TNA thinks. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you know what else we here. had happen in two, in 2003? We actually had in the early show we had a couple of the oldsters come back. We had Jesse Taylor come back and work Eddie Golden, and I remember it being a good match. But I also remember that it sort of stood out as not what the crowd was looking to see at that point that they sort of were there and it was okay, but it wasn't it wasn't like it had been when they were on top back in 1999 or early 2000. It, the, the, everything had changed, and I, th- I think they were surprised that it wasn't as easy as it was, used to be, um, for them to get over the way they had before. It was, a, it was more of a challenge, and not that they didn't work a good match, also had a, a disappointing match, and it's amazing given the people involved on, on Hardcore Hell with David Young taking on Bull Buchanan, uh, which, which should have been a whole lot better, and for some reason the crowd didn't enjoy as much as I would have liked them to. No, I remember that, and I, I don't understand what happened there. They just maybe they weren't buying what they I were booked selling. That as, I booked that as, as sort of like the, the you know one of the highlight matches of the whole thing going into because – we had had a really strong, a unusually strong first night because, and over the objections of many, I booked AJ to work um, uh, Ron the Truth Killings in a TNA match with, and brought in the living legend, Larry Zabisco. Um, 
who uh, went on commentary and did a brilliant job with you during that. And almost everybody was going, why is that our, not our main event on Saturday? And my answer was because it's a standalone match and it has nothing to do with storyline. And so it's going to be where it is. And um, yeah, it was a good place, I thought, for that. But it ended up it ended up being it was a really good match. But uh, you know we had a really strong we had a strong thing. We had one of our double elimination for the junior title things. We had Sal against Kid Cool against Jeremy B against uh, Slim J on that in that first day. We had a ladder match for the tag team titles with Scotty Wren and Tank and the Lost Boys and Future Shock um, that I don't remember sucking. And um, Bulldog Reigns had been picked up by Al Getz as part of Al Getz Enterprises with the Dobbins brothers, and he worked hot stuff. I don't remember that being great, but I don't, you know, I, I was certainly big guys. Yeah, it was an so impressive we had, we had a- showing for hot stuff, being able to toss Bulldog around there. Um, but one thing that really stood out to me, and you mentioned the match, but was the angle with um, – they did the injury ankle on Jeremy V's neck in night one in the four-way dance for the junior title. And then come back the next night, and he's wrestling Rain Man for the television championship, uh, and he's got the neck injury. And there, that was just such a great emotional roller coaster of a match the second night. Was that, was that, was that, the, was that the night that the suspension of disbelief was so profound that Nurse Kathy was about to jump the railing to take care of him on the outside? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we had fans crying in the front row. Several fans were just bawling their eyes out. Well, Jeremy Jeremy V was the second. Uh, Slimmy will always be uh, just because he, it's impossible for him not to be. Even now, little buff Slimmy, who's you know now built and it was skinnier back then. But I always had what was referred either, either they were referred to as my favorite, um, which which was an ongoing in quotations joke in the locker room. But but I always had one skinny, long-haired guy that was my go-to cell monkey, uh, as I referred to it. And the cell monkey is, of course, uh, because, you know, baby faces sit down there and they're getting their asses kicked, and the long-haired guys will flip their hair back and sit there and go, ooh, ee, ee, I'm hurt, ah, ah, you know, just like a little monkey. And so they became my cell monkeys. And Jimmy Rave had been the first of the cell monkeys. And he was beginning to graduate out of that. The crowd slowly but surely over time was was turning him heel, and eventually I turned him heel in a um, in an I quit match with Tony Mamaluke by throwing the towel in, which was just a terrible finish, and uh, turned him heel. Um, but Jeremy V was the second uh, and a brilliant cell monkey. And, of course, when he came in, he was immediately – you looked at him and you went baby face. And I said, what's your wrestling name? And he said, uh, Jeremy Vane. And I said, you're a baby face. He said, yes. And I went, well, then you're not going to be Jeremy Vane because baby faces aren't vain. So he became one of our many initialed people. We had a lot of initialed people. We had Brandon Phoenix became Brandon P because we already had a John Phoenix. And we had to have Jeremy V because I wouldn't accept Vane. Of course, now he is Vane, but it fits better. Yeah, it all came full circle at that point. It actually made sense when he did it. But uh, moving on to 2003, saw the debut of Alter Boy Luke, who was involved in a major storyline there and made a big splash. I had fans had seen him a little bit on XPW at that point, uh, but then he later, as we moved past Hardcore Hell and Beyond, became aligned with Lost Boy Gabriel as the quote-unquote God Squad, and one of our greatest feuds of all time started kindling there. Yeah, and went on for quite a while, except for off, uh, Oren had a minor legal issue that had him lose a loser leave town at one point because uh, uh, he was out of pocket for a bit. But otherwise, yeah, we had set up it and then we brought it back together and eventually we paid it off in a major angle that was remains and this obviously goes all the way to 2004 now. Very little we did went quickly if it was working. We we took our time. Uh, we, we sort of crucified Alter Boy at one point, not not as dramatically as ECW had tried to do, uh, but we tied him up in the ropes with his arms spread and sort of a, a mock thing. And Jeff G. Bailey was the devil. And we did an awful lot with Alter Boy. He, um, we brought in Wolfie D at one point with Azrael to work against the God Squad um, when, he, when Wolfie was doing his Slash character. And, um, you know, so we, we really sort of pushed it and we had Sinister Minister there with them. And, you know, so we, we were having a lot of fun with God versus the devil 
uh, with an eventual payoff down the line that involved Dusty Rhodes, AJ Styles, and Christopher Daniels. Yes. And so we'll get a lot of mileage out of that. And it's amazing now, um, Alter Boy was one of those guys, I, I've talked about it, there's certain guys that come out, uh, and, and, he, and he had a tremendous love-hate relationship with the locker room. You either loved him or hated him because Alter Boy goes in and, you know, has to have the biggest one in the locker room sometimes. And he's, you know, been one of my kids for a long time, and I'm the first to tell him that. He's also extremely stubborn. Uh, so he didn't go to a gym. He didn't work out. He didn't try. He had, naturally, he had an okay physique, attractive kid, um, which was always the thing that drew you know, the fans to him, but there was something about just his presence. And there's a number of people that have gone through our curtain. AJ is, of course, one of the most profound, but Alter Boy was, was in that class that when he came out, the crowd wanted to chant Luke, 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 and didn't stop. He never lost the support of that, that crowd. Um, and to this day, even though he's not really been part of anything we've done for years, if he shows up, the few people that remember from back in the day still will chant Luke, Luke, Luke. That's oh, why yeah. I told him when he was changing his name at one point, I said, you can't lose Luke. You know, you, unfortunately, you're that guy. You can, maybe you're no longer an altar boy, God knows, but that's where he came up with Luke Hawks years later, which is a combination of Luke that brought him to the party and his real last name, Hawkshurst. So it, you know, but, but he was one of our standout guys and another one that, that sacrificed and drove long distances to see what he could accomplish and uh, was a standout. But it was also at that time, as we went into the middle of the latter part of the year, that we started to see the Midwest guys make their appearances. And we also saw the first appearance of um, one of your friends from, the, from Tennessee, the second-generation star, Ray Gordy. But we saw Delirious, and we started seeing Matt Seidel and Daisy Hayes and Ray Gordy. And all of a sudden, business started really picking up in our, our junior division. Um, and almost every match seemed to have, you know, nine people in it. it you know, we, we, we had too many freaking people, so we had all of these junior sudden death matches. But they were brilliant. <laughs> The guys did a wonderful job, and somehow we avoided them being total clusters where they had every potential to be. In fact, I look back on some of the multi-person ladder matches that preceded the, the cluster matches we had with our juniors later, and I find the older ladder matches to be more clustery than I did the junior matches we did. The, the kids really tried hard to make them make sense, I always thought. Yeah, and the guys that had been there for a couple of years were starting to get grounded and get better, and then you had a new generation of guys coming into mix. So it really uh, started, we had a great year in 2002, but as nature of what we do, guys were going off to better opportunities. New guys were coming right in to fill their place, and that was great, and I think that's a perfect way to end this discussion here on the 2002-2003 time. Uh, and then next week we're going to look at 04 and 05 and the end of Wildside. But, Bill, this has been a great look into the history of the promotion, and I dare say we're probably not done as once I get through a bunch of the talent. Um, there's probably going to be questions about stories and accountings that I'll probably have you back to verify. So, But for now, next week will be the final interview in this series. Oh, by the way, I'll leave. I'll leave. It's one of the things that also opened up is, um, uh, and and it, it's it's important only because of where it ended up at the end of Wildside. But in 2003, we saw the influx also of the Alabamians, um, yeah. which was TC Carnage and Adam Roberts, Alabama Attitude, with uh, a young man who had then was called Zero X, um, who I believe did the very entertaining uh, "Why Are the Alabamians Not on Frat Mat?" and um, and, of course, he then eventually became the human action figure, moved off on his own, and Patrick Bentley uh, ended up doing very, very well for himself and another one of my my favorite kids. But we had those guys coming in, and at the same time, we also had uh, one of my other kids, Mike Posey, coming in as a referee. Um, and that's another area where we haven't even talked about that, and we probably should at some point. One of the areas that was extremely important, we we had okay refs back when we first started, and I'll let this be the last thing we talk about. But we really upped the ante on quality refing when we started having these talented people come in from all over. Our refs needed to be able to keep up. We, we You couldn't just be a fat guy and go out there and do the job. 
much like when you showed up and were, you know, and, and uh, I remember, was, was it you or young Andrew that was nearly run over by somebody pissed off he was losing his job? That was me. Okay, yeah. But, and you know, regardless, we ended up, Andrew Thomas had been put in as the senior referee, an exceptional referee. World Championship Wrestling. And at this time, I would like to bring on the air our special guest, Mr. Bill Barons. Welcome to the program. And thank you very, very much. And it's nice. It's nice to have everything working. Yeah, you never know what kind of technical issues you're going to run into in the podcast world, but we're going to keep on keeping on, and we're glad. To I have think it has something here. to do with this being part of a black mass. That's all I'm thinking. Perhaps. I, I tend to have that effect on electronics of all kinds, but that's a whole other story. Um, part two of the interview, I uh, just recapped a little bit of, of what we talked about last week. Now moving on into the time we were the official development territory for World Championship Wrestling. I guess right out of the gate, um, first of all, any thoughts on last week's topic that you didn't maybe get to after listening to the interview and into the WCW development deal exactly. Tell us uh, how that came about in terms of, of the negotiations and whatnot. Um, th- probably a combo package. I, th- I think I mentioned last time, uh, and if not, um, it, it sort of all flows together. We, we sort of got on the radar of WCW for a number of uh, reasons. One, uh, and I forget the exact timetable, but it was in 2000, I convinced uh, Ray Rawls and Steve Martin over vehement objections to book Terry Taylor and pay him more than we had ever paid any human in that building. And, and, and to this day, no one's ever been paid as much. It just happens to be the case. Well, I did it for a reason. Uh, as it turned out, we got a good match and an excellent angle out of it. He was then the mecca of manhood, and he was the North American champion for the NWA, and he wrestled Mike Rapata. And an angle was done with Mike's kid, uh, Little Mike. And it was a good little segment. It looked good. Um, but that wasn't the reason we did it. The reason we did it is that I had been working off and on with Terry for years when he was with WWE. And Terry always seemed to show up somewhere with influence. Uh, It's simply been part of his career. He's bounced around a lot, but he's always had influence, and he's always been part of my circle. Um, But this really sort of established that. And I knew that if I got him into the building, he would see what I was aware, and that was that we were doing something special. At the same time, Air Paris and... uh, AJ Styles were involved in a feud that was gaining quite a bit of notoriety, particularly among WCW's lower tier, which were still guys making a lot of money, particularly Bob Ryder and Jeremy Barash, who had a uh, early version of a podcast uh, on the Internet. They had WCW Live, I think it was called, and um, which Jeremy uh, got paid a six-figure salary to sit in a hot tub and do. It was one of the great jobs ever in the history of wrestling. And these guys started showing up at our shows, particularly Jeremy, who would come in and throw himself on commentary periodically. And they began putting over that feud and the company in general. Prior to that, we came to the attention of Jimmy Hart when he saw the Bad Street Boys video that we had done in Nashville. Uh, Burt Prentice had actually produced that and done one of the best things he's ever done with um, Shane Chan, Christian, and Joey. And everybody involved got offered something, and two out of those people were thrown with Evan Courageous and became three count and started their career making money in the wrestling business. So all of this was sort of happening around the same time. In the midst of all this, Burt Prentice had a half-assed development deal for a period of time, and the perception became, for reasons unknown, um, that he was skimming money. And they were paying him guaranteed money, and he was supposed to pay the guys – the wrestlers out of that money in some fashion that I never knew. I I never knew the specifics of the deal, but that that's what happened. And they canned Bert, whether he had done anything wrong or not, I'll never know to this day, but the reality is that's what was going on. And this was all hovering around the, the middle to latter part going into the summer, I guess of 2000. And I got a phone call saying, you know, would you be interested in being involved in development? We're not working with Bert anymore. And it, we've narrowed it down to, to two people. We've narrowed it down to you or Les Thatcher. And I went, sure, that'd be awesome. Uh, What's involved? And generalizations were presented based on what Burt's deal was. 
but they wanted to check out. Well, Terry had already been to my promotion, and J.J. came in at one point, and while our building doesn't impress from the outside, for some reason it seems to always impress from the inside, even though it isn't overwhelming by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a little building that used to be a high school gym that's set up to do TV, and you just plug in and we do it, and off, we're off and running. They went up and visited Les Thatcher, particularly J.J. did, um, and I never understood why, but J.J. hated, I'm not disliked, hated whatever Les's facility was at the time, and I don't know the specifics of why he hated it. I just know that Terry called and said, well, uh, there is no competition anymore. J.J. hated Les Thatcher's thing, so it's now you. And I went, oh, cool, okay. So I went into a meeting. And they started talking to me about how they felt burnt by the bird experience and blah, blah. And I said, well, I'm not really good at just taking money uh, anyway. I like to be incentivized and I like to earn money. I've done that in my TV career and I've been it's sort of the way I, I work. So why don't we – what are your goals here? And they said, well, we get a lot of green guys here, a lot of young guys we're putting on TV, Jindrak and O'Hare, and it goes on and on. And and they're just not ready, but but we're sort of being forced into it because, again, this is at the tail end and things were starting to sort of unravel at WCW at some level. In fact, at this point, we're probably six months away from the end, but we didn't know that. Uh, but they were losing talent. They were throwing young guys out there trying to fill the gaps, and they'd, you know, they were ready to sign more people and trying to repair for the damage that had been done when a bunch of people decided to leave the Guerreros and, and so on had taken off. So I said, um, well, if you want to get a bunch of guys booked, why don't you pay me per person? And then secondarily, uh, that'll incentivize, you know, that'll, that'll, A, that'll incentivize, you know, me, you guys, I hope to book a lot of guys and I'll, I'll like that. And at one time or another, we had as many as 10 guys on a show once this started. And then um, the other one was it would incentivize us to open other towns and promote more regularly. And there were weeks as we got going where we promoted as many as five times and almost always three times. So we really got up and running and we're doing 150 to 200 shows a year or would have if this thing had lasted. Um, I was told I had to get a, uh, a specific insurance policy. I had before that been sharing an insurance policy with Bird, as it turned out, uh, which I had bought, and then it got canceled. And the new insurance policy that I was using was in Mike Porter's name, and I couldn't use that, so I had to go get my own insurance. They said the deal is done. Let's get going. Paperwork was sent. I sent it in, and I got the insurance, paid the bill, and I received notification that they didn't want to go forward. Um, and I went, well, crap. So I started writing emails going, okay, hey, guys, I've just gone out of pocket $1,500 and some other expenses to get ready based on a contract that's signed, and now I just get a notice from your legal department you want to cancel what the crap's going on. And they went, oh, I don't know, but I think it's going to get straightened out. Just be patient, and if it doesn't, we'll, we'll pay you back all of your out of pocket, and we're sorry. And so we were in limbo, and this is, oh, golly, I want to say it's, it's October of 2000, um, and we were supposed to have guys – delivered by, I think, October 23rd was supposed to be the first date, and as of now, we don't have a deal uh, and no money. And but, Well, the, fortunately, things got corrected. Everything was fine, and all of a sudden, we got up and running in uh, early November, literally the, the very beginning of November is my memory, uh, and started getting a lot of guys in. We had a, a core group that we were sort of a, a very quickly assigned um, – that consisted of Sam Greco, Troy Endress, um, Bob Sapp, who, who materialized into becoming the most famous of them, with or and or David Flair, who was already on television but couldn't do anything basically. Um, then we had what is, who do we have? Danny Fakur, whose name was interesting to pronounce if you weren't careful. Um, and then we had other people like Kevin North cut in for a period of time. Chris Harris was assigned to us. Uh, so the, the, we had a, a fairly large list of folk. Um, in fact, when I wrote a uh, a breakdown, uh, we uh, and I forget when this was. Let's see. In February, it was Sam Greco, Danny Fakur, the Beast, uh, Omen, which was Troy, Scotty Patrick, who we changed to Sexy Scotty Saber, which I guess was his original name. 
uh, David Flair, Kevin Northcutt, Steve Sharp, who had been De Flava, uh, God only knows why, uh, Chris Harris, and Robbie Rage ended up uh, being added, uh, leading to an incredibly in- uh, entertaining uh, Robbie Rage versus AJ match at Bumpers one time that we'll, we'll go into. But we were signed all these guys, and then in addition, we were given – the TV stars and, and a lot of these guys were, were young and as green as the guys that we were assigned that hadn't yet made TV or were just doing occasional superstars things. Uh, we ended up being assigned Johnny the Bull periodically. We had him on a lot of shows. We had um, Jindrak and O'Hare. We had Kaz. We had Jimmy Yang. Mike Sanders came in and worked for us quite a bit. Um, Jamie Noble we, was part of that. Yeah, we had Jamie Noble, Evan Courageous, Shannon, and Shane came in and actually won our tag titles uh, on a Friday and lost them on a Saturday. So they can, they were able to, three count was able to claim to have been a wild side tag team champion. Uh, the one we did the most with, uh, really in terms of storyline and really integrating within our little happy family, was David Flair. Uh, the other guys were were real easy to work with, although uh, a couple were harder than others, and, and Robbie Rage was periodically just scary. But... Um, and the beast was just entertaining, but, uh, David was the one that really meshed in the most and the one that we had from the very beginning to the, to the bitter end. And, um, first time he came there, he went out, did a match, came to the back and started crying, which I remember vividly. And I, I went up and said, what's wrong? And he said, I, I can't do this. I'm never going to be as good as my dad. Um, and I went, well, why is that an issue? You know, why? Why do you have to be as good as your dad? You just need to be the best you you are. And the key to doing that is to f- have a good time, to calm down, to not put so much pressure on yourself. And that was the beginning of a, what was a good relationship with him and a real growth for him. And, and it caused him to improve. And that improvement was then seen later in TNA when he had a brief run there. He, he never got to be great, but he got to be good with us. Uh, I remember when he came in one day, and I forget this, the reason, but I had decided he was going to take a superplex off the top, and he said he wouldn't do it. He was scared of it. And I periodically, I've, I've learned that uh, you plant the seed and you don't argue a lot. You walk away and see what happens. And you know, and I told him 100%. I totally understood, and if he was scared to do something, then you definitely shouldn't do it. I mean, obviously, a lot of other people do it and are fine, and he can talk to the wrestlers, and they'll tell him that he'll be protected and he'll be fine. But if he's scared and doesn't want to do anything, I, I would never force him to do it, and, you know, no problem at all. And then, uh, I don't know, about a half hour later, he came up with a beaming smile and said, guess what? And I went, what, David? He said, I'm taking a superplex. And I think that it sort of underscores the environment we were in. He did – talk to the other guys. They did make him comfortable, and he was on cloud nine when he came to the back, and he had executed it. And then we put him with Romeo Bliss and made them tag champions. Romeo cut promos a little like his dad, um, although a somewhat different character, but with some of the same swagger. And one of, one, of my more, one of the more entertaining guys we had, I thought at the time, one of the ones that uh, started with NCW and that fit in really well once we became wild side and changed direction. There were only three or four of those guys, honestly, that translated well to as we move forward with wild side from the NCW time. A lot of people just dropped off the map. But Romeo, uh, who later went on to to become, I guess, Bubba on Survivor, um, Romeo was one of those guys that really, uh, really was part of the family all the way through and until he ended up sort of backing out of wrestling entirely, even though he did come back and, and did an appearance near the end of Wildside. But um, so that was really the start of the whole thing. We thought it was going to be a really big, long running, you know, exciting thing. And for a period of time, it appeared that way. Um, and we were running shows. Ray Rawls started running in Tacoa, so we had a regular Sunday show. We started up running on the Fridays, which is really how we got Fridays going. We had before just on first and third Saturdays, and we had not really ever run on Fridays except that I had made Hardcore Hell a, a two-night thing. Um, so that was the one time we were running Fridays preceding that, uh, as we did a, a two-nighter for Hardcore Hell historically. But otherwise, Fridays were brand new, and then uh, Andrew Thomas would periodically run bumpers, and particularly with this talent, because with that 50 bucks per guy, 
I came to a deal with all of the, quote, promoters, young Andrew, as I always called him, um, with Steve Martin and with Ray Rawls, um, and that included all shows at the arena, that they would get 40% of the money. Uh, even though it was my deal, I could have, you know, just hung on to the money and gone, ha, 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 look at me. But uh, instead, I incentivized them to want to do more. So, A, they got free talent, as many as 10 people on a show, all with some, and in many cases, with, with name recognition, um, and then got paid to take that talent. So it was like the holy grail. Uh, they only had to maybe book another eight or nine people and pay them you know, the 20 to 40 that they, you know, would pay out. And it was hard not to make money. So everybody was having a good time. And then we were doing really good. And and then things started changing for WCW. Yeah, um, it was uh, not very long lived. As you mentioned, uh, you know, WWE has come in now at this point, and we're hearing the rumors that WCW is going out of business, but then we find out that they've been purchased, so kind of ended well, that. Well, in fact, we the writing was on the wall before that. I read the first, uh, and, this, and everything that sort of came down came down in February, and if, if you remember the, you know, the history, the last Nitro was, was March 26th of 2001. Uh, our last use of talent was March 21st. But we had received a note firing us, in essence, in late February. They already knew they were selling. Um, I had been involved before that uh, in one of the two efforts to buy the company. One was conducted by Eric Bischoff, and the other one was Jerry Jarrett. And I had consulted to Jerry and had had run the numbers on on acquiring the company. And the key uh, for both entities was that uh, Time Warner AOL would – hang on to the TV show because uh, WCW always had the benefit of being guaranteed television because it ran on their, on the, what was originally the Turner and inevitably the time Warner own channels. So it was like the perfect deal. Uh, and, and again, why they could not make it profitable uh, has to do with some of the silliness of their contracts. I mean, tank Abbott, who was assigned to us would be an example, a guy making $750,000 being flown first class to go to Cornelia, Georgia. So, you know, it's just that kind of deal made no sense. And all they ended up doing with that guy was having him uh, look seductively at three count while dancing, which was good for him, but wasn't necessarily um, the most effective use of his potential talent. Uh, I re- I'm reminded that other than the one punch he threw at Sabu, which actually looked good, uh, he threw the worst punches of anybody we'd ever brought into that building. They were just they were terrible and you know legit tough guy, and he just could yeah, not throw uh, a punch for the life of him. I, a moment on him actually, because I, I remember having a conversation with him. You know, he scared me to fucking death. Here I am, just a, a young kid coming in there, and then here's this ultimate fighter, and he's all pissed off. And I'm like, hey, how's it going? You know, and he says, man bullshit. And he starts explaining that apparently in WCW's contract negotiations with him, they had hired him as a special appearance type of guy based on his UFC credentials. So apparently it was just to bring him in to do the match with Goldberg. He was supposed to get trained for the one match and then maybe come back and do a few appearances here and there. And before he knew it, they had him flying first class to Atlanta to go to Cordelia, Georgia, to learn how to wrestle, and he wasn't too fucking happy about that. No, we, we had a, we had a number of the guys that, and and Terry would always say, "Shut him down." Um, so we did. I mean, and I was the guy that had to do it. A Jim and O'Hare came in, and we put them into a match with the Boogaloo Crew uh, with J C Daz, who's a small person. And Scotty Wren, who's a bigger person but wasn't as tall as either of the two guys, either Jindrak nor, nor O'Hare. And I wanted them to go under uh, because it was important in what we were doing for our guys. And that was part of the agreement was that we didn't have just have to bring these guys in and make them into the gods of the arena. They had to be integrated. They were going to be integrated over and under was up to me. And they weren't all pushed to be the champions. Uh, Some became champions. Uh, Robbie Rage demolished AJ literally uh, at bumpers one time to become the uh, television champion. Uh, AJ decided to demonstrate his amateur wrestling skills, and that was not a really good idea uh, because Robbie Rage just ate him up that night, and 
AJ to this day remembers the pain of that experience. Uh, but also it was good having Robbie rage around because if any of these guys acted up, I could just go to Robbie and go, well, would you have a, a talk and tell them you'll kill them? And, and usually that calmed them down. But we did a, a few attitudes. And then we had guys that would do anything. Troy Endress, big SOB that wrestled as Omen, was just a sweetheart. He'd do whatever you want. Bob Sapp uh, was like a big kid um, and, and always wanted to do more. I remember when he had this great idea where he was going to be, uh, he, he had this idea to be like a priest character. He was going to um, be the of death. I remember and that. that he, and, and he wanted to use a Bible as a weapon. Then he had this whole, you know, it was going to be a, a carved out Bible with a brick in it or something. And I went, I, I, you know, I really don't think using the Bible as a weapon is going to play real well in any theater, uh, you know. And, and more importantly, the character was like a, a why because he, as the beast, which is how we were using him, he just had natural charisma. One of the greatest things he ever did wasn't even a match. It was a dance-off with Onyx. And it was just – it was hilariously funny, and the crowd loved it. And so he didn't have to do that much to get over, and he, but he was always coming up with these silly ideas like, like the, you know, the priest gimmick with the, with the Bible and all of these other things, which made him thoroughly entertaining to deal with. Um, Sam Greco was another one that was incredibly easy to work with um, that I thought um, – Danny Fakur occasionally was a little more difficult um, and had a tendency to get a whiny pouty going on stuff, if he, particularly if he was going under. Um, so it just depended on the uh, guy. Not, and not a lot of these guys got a lot of TV time. They did a little superstars, and that was really about it. You know, Abbott got a little bit of a TV spot. Sanders, um, who had, had come in for us a little bit before even WCW, he ended up getting a talking spot inevitably. Um, but really not a lot of the guys got very far because they're, by the time they were getting ready, uh, the company was going out of business. So in February, we were told they were canceling the deal. The deal was supposed to run through the 28th of March. Of course, the company closed on the 26th, which given the fact that it was less than a month earlier that I got that notice, now looking back, clearly they had already come to the agreement with Vince to sell the assets, had identified the date they were rolling it over, and that's why we were leased. Prior to that, Eric Bischoff had yanked all of the um, TV guys off of the shows uh, after they had been booked. But we, we had those guys all the way through. Golly, we were, we were getting guys into late into February. We were still booking guys. So it's not like, you know, because on February 23rd and 24th, we had Jimmy Yang and Kaz and Mike Sanders and, so it's you know it, it wasn't a long period of time, but going into March, we didn't know what was going on. We hoped that we you know and Terry Taylor really wasn't in the loop on the company going in business uh, that much. He had everybody had rumor, so we were being told that you know it was going to be reevaluated. We might be doing more, and then we got all the way to March 21st, and we had like four guys was <laughs> was all that was left. Um, I think I think it was the beast. Uh, Probably had the Beast, Omen, uh, David Flair, and, you know, toss a coin, uh, you know, Sam Greco or somebody like that. Yeah, with yeah, the I other one or Danny Fakur. Come back. I, I believe huh? Greco came back. I, I don't think Danny Fakur well, Greco came had, back. Greco had one, one perfect storm of a bad time because he was supposedly this, this kickboxer guy from Australia. And uh, they, it's um, I, I guess they didn't know until after the fact that he wasn't – you know, the Rob Van Dam, or they're not the Rob Van Dam, the, the Van Dam or the uh, the martial arts uh, guy of Australia that he had claimed to be. and But they brought him into Australia, and he was going to do a run-in, which they assumed would get this huge response on an Australia tour that was right near the end. And he came running down to the ring to to thundering ambivalence. Nobody knew who he was. He jumped up, leaped over the top rope, his foot caught the rope, and he fell on his face. Uh, and that was his debut. Uh, and that's when we got him back. <laughs> yeah, so. and he did pretty well for himself. And super guy, like he went on to do a lot of stunt work. He's been in several movies. And uh, the last I checked, I tried to actually do a little research and get some verification, but it looks like he's still getting work doing that. So um, you know, yeah, I, I noticed he did that. To do something good. They they had their decent instincts on the guys they brought in. Um, it it's just in some cases. 
uh, it was a little too late all the way through. By the way, in the midst of all of this, um, we had, uh, you know, a minor moment where both Air Paris, uh, well, actually Easy Money also, who had every time he had come in for us prior to his tryout, had slipped on a banana peel and had a terrible match. He had this, I think the very third time, literally, he came in, he had the match in front of Terry Taylor and finally hit everything. And it was the first time ever for him. Uh, and, yeah, and uh, funny you know, enough, he had already been headlining in ECW at that time. So I don't know. I'm sure he was great. I don't know if it was just like bad luck. Every time he came down to us, he just had a terrible We had a couple like that. Champ- every time Champagne came in before that, he was always a mic guy. He was a barely a wrestler, and the mic would always fry on him. It was, <laughs> you know, just some guys were the you know had a perfect storm when they came to us. But um, Terry had come in. Obviously, Bob, uh, Bob and Jeremy Barash were huge supporters of AJ and and Paris. Paris, incredibly talented young man who uh, avoided gyms like the plague. And AJ, an incredibly talented young man who worked hard on his craft, his body, and is now one of the, if not the top star in the wrestling business. And that, I guess, is the key difference between those two. But they were both signed. They got highly lucrative $300 deals. Um, And those were signed literally in, I believe, February, January, February of 2011. And they went on, and I believe, had a total each of two television matches, if I remember correctly, uh, teamed together as Air Raid, um, and their outfits looked terrible. Paris's didn't fit well, but uh, that was that was our our little shining moment. Uh, Stone Mountain actually had a tryout just four or five months before the end, and we were online to get and was online to get signed also, and just unfortunately everything ended. And an awful lot of our other people were were at least on the radar. Um, if WCW had been able to continue, it, you know, you never know uh, how many people might have went in. But again, um, while Air Paris didn't get another opportunity in a big league, uh, WCW going away, he was offered a development deal very soon after that by WWE, uh, which would have sent him up to, as it turned out, Les Thatcher, because uh, they had by then embraced less. Once we got embraced by WCW, WWE had embraced less at Hart Heartland. So, um, and then in early 2002, uh, we were contacted by the Jarrett's and AJ did a tryout with David Young, uh, that Jimmy Rave was also at in Nashville. And, um, David Young and AJ were the first two that were offered contracts. AJ actually signed his on a tour we did that I think was in January of that year in Australia that I went on also and helped on run the backstage because, I was supposed to be uh, one of the jobs I was supposed to have at TNA and ended up having was to be the uh, the gorilla area guy, the go guy. Um, and uh, I got a highly lucrative $300 deal to do that. That put me into debt for quite a while. Um, but AJ got signed, decided to go with TNA. Tough decision. Uh, he had just bought a house, and that was the primary reason. He uh, didn't want to leave home and leave Wendy with a new house and uh, – you know, a just recently married situation, and he uh, thought TNA, which at the time was just going to be these Wednesday shows, pay-per-views every Wednesday, sounded like an easy gig. You drive up, you drive home, you're gone for a day. Easy peasy. Um, and it certainly developed into a whole lot more over time. So some good came out of the bad that we had, but that was our very limited run as the WCW development area, and it sort of reinforced what I believed uh, was my spot in wrestling and believe my spot still is in wrestling, and that is to identify and develop talent. I'm a firm believer in uh, the it factor. I just believe that I, there are people, and it may not be reflected always in their in-ring skill at the time you see them, but there's something about certain people when they come down a ramp that instantly identifies them as something special. And and the crowd usually is on top of it very, very quickly. Um, and I hope to be on top of it. And an example, because he was not a great worker, but I thought in the tapes I had seen and conversations I had had with Orrin Hawkshurst when he ended up coming in as Alter Boy Luke, um, that he had that. But, you know, in essence, he was this good-looking skinny kid with – bad punching, bad kicks, and some decent high spots and needed a lot of work. 
But when he came out the curtain, the crowd loved him, and the Luke Luke chant started almost from day one. And, you know, sometimes, you know, my instincts aren't aren't perfect on that, but a lot of people have had the it factor, and a lot of people with the it factor uh, ended up making some money in professional wrestling, and we ended up being blessed to be involved in it. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, that's one thing we always tout that we're proudest of are, are the guys that got out of, of what we did and went on to make some money. And you can't do that if you can't sell tickets, and the it factor does that. Um, we're into the overrun period now of, of our little recording segment. It usually lasts about 15 minutes, so we'll just get in a, a few final thoughts, kind of backtracking a little bit. Does it speak, first of all, to the epic mismanagement of WCW that they – hire us to get wrestlers ready to perform on television, and Eric Bischoff decides that he wants to pull talent from television. Well, I think by the time Eric did that, he was already trying to buy the company, knowing that AOL Time Warner and its management had come in and went, we don't want this. Um, Whether it's profitable or not, we don't want it. No matter how much cash flow there is, we don't want it. And there was a lot of cash flow on WCW. The, the biggest problem WCW had is that it had been from the beginning in terms of contracts badly managed. And all you have to do is pick up a lot of books, Ole Anderson's book, any number of books. Anybody who was in the, the booker position there, read their book, and you'll be amazed at what these guys were told to do. Literally, Ole Anderson with, um, uh, with Vader. I had cut a deal for, and I'm going to make a number up, and I'm probably close, but he had cut a deal for like $75,000 for Vader to come in to be a full-timer, and Vader was on cloud nine. Hey, you know, I can stay home. I can, you know, I was in, he was in Japan at the time. Now he can stay in the United States, all good, and he went to management. He said, I got him for $75,000. They said, oh, gosh, well, that's not going to work. Then he went, well, what's wrong? I said, oh, I mean, you know, that just isn't going to jive with other salary levels, so you, you need to pay him more, and – and that sort of underscored the problem. And then once they handed the checkbook to Eric, um, he, more than anyone before him, didn't care that it made no sense. He he jumped on that horse and rode it until it was until it was you know its back was broken, and just threw the money and you know started bringing in guys that had deals with Creative Control and were making and and uh, and had uh, sweetheart deals where if somebody else got a dollar more they got that dollar too um which was kevin nash's deal and it it became you know really overwhelming because uh the product as a result over time began getting fragmented because no matter what they had scripted they'd get to the tapings and everything changed because the guys involved could and once another company came in that was brand new and looked at that aspect of it you know, Bobby Heenan enjoying a lovely beverage at a road wild. You know, there, there was this an element of unprofessionalism that occurred a little bit too often there that should not have been tolerated at the level it was. And over time, it built up to the point where a responsible new company with a, a guy, I think it was Jamie Kellner, was in there at the time who wasn't that interested in wrestling to begin with, looked at the pluses and minuses, and there were just enough minuses that the pluses didn't matter. So when Bischoff pulled guys from us, he already knew it was going under. Uh, cause, and I already knew there was a problem, too, because I had already been doing research with Jerry Jarrett trying to buy it. We knew there was, it was only a matter of time, and it was just a win kind of thing. Um, I think the, the March end came a little quicker than we thought because uh, Jerry didn't pull the plug on his consideration until March and we had no idea where Bischoff was, and the Internet rumors at the time had Bischoff as the guy that was going to buy it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Vince was a surprise. Uh, but it wasn't a surprise after we found out what he bought, because he didn't buy um, anything he didn't want. He primarily bought the library. And, and he bought, to the extent he wanted them, the contracts. But a number of the contracts were specifically with the corporation rather than with the corporate entity that was the wrestling, rather than WCW. So a number of the guys had pay-or-play kind of deals that just had to be played out, um, including most of the top talent, you know, the Hogans and the Nashes and people like that. Their their contract, uh, even if the company was sold, had to be paid. 
and and also in the midst of all this, there were some lawsuits that were out there with with various non-talented people suing for discrimination, including the now incarcerated Hardbody Harrison. Um, so they, there was a lot of nonsense going around WCW at a profound level that took away from um, the positive things they had done over the years, and and really the surge they created and Bischoff can be credited with of. Uh, getting the wrestling business fired up again, and more importantly, motivating WWE to dramatically change its product from a relatively cartoony form of programming that they had done off and on for years to the Attitude Era that brought them forward very aggressively and until recently, more defined them than anything else. Recently, they took a step back to a a G-rated product and have suffered as a result of it. Yeah, and um, it's very interesting. You know, you talk about my favorite story, actually, from the the WCW uh, follies of management would be that, and I don't know how true this is, but I've heard this rumor, that apparently they had Lanny Poffo under contract for like four years and were paying him six figures and didn't even know it. Yes. Oh, yeah, well, there was always those side deals because that's one of the reasons Savage came was he, he got a deal for his brother, and, and then really nothing was ever done with that. There's a lot of that kind of stuff, just silly money thrown around, guys making much. Well, I, no disrespect to Bob Ryder and Jeremy Brush, but they'd be the first to tell you that their six-figure salaries were something they giggled about because they did nothing. I mean, relatively nothing for those at the time. That it was just, you know, here, have some money. Everybody gets money. Money get, And my deal was one of the really unique ones in that I'm, I was one of the guys actually having to earn the money which was very strange, but I was also near the end. And by then they were starting to nickel and dime. Like I said, AJ and Paris were a 300 a show deal. Um, and, and the W the WCW a few years before that would have never done that. They would have never paid just a $300 deal. That would have, that would have never flown. It was oh my, how can we possibly do that? That's just crazy talk. So I think things had changed dramatically at that point. And, and, and it was a real shame. And, uh, it's interesting that when WCW went out of business, it was still doing a really solid number with Nitro. And um, and, and looking at the numbers that are out there now where Raw does a 3, 3.1, 3.2, and that's a good rating, both of the companies were doing an excess of a five minimum on most weeks. And immediately when WCW went away, that other five uh, that ran head-to-head against Raw, that other five vanished. It was the impetus to create TNA and do weekly pay-per-views. The thought process is that audience has to still be out there and we'll offer them a value of four pay-per-views, two hours each for the same money. They'd buy one pay-per-view, three hours. So eight hours versus three hours, stars they know and, and the up-and-coming stars, and they, uh, it didn't work. But fortunately, TNA survived and hasn't quite resurrected the business, but at least somebody came in to fill that gap and survived. Yeah, they're giving people jobs. So say what you want about TNA, but they're paying salaries. And as folk in the business, you know, we, we have to appreciate that. Um, just as we're getting to the end of this interview, I'm kind of flash forwarding to next week in part three of the interview. As we move forward into the history of Wild Side, we now know what happened at the beginning and end of the WCW era. And really was a, there represented very much the middle point, in my mind, between the changing of the guards of the NCW crew and what later became known worldwide as the Wild Side crew. And so, you know, we had Air Paris and AJ leave there towards the end. They they left and went off to do Nitro and, and whatever, and, and they weren't on our TV anymore. But as soon as WCW went out of business, we got them back, and that's really – where they were were carrying things for sure, we kind of put the whole ball in their court at that point, and they were like the spokesperson, uh, the spokespeople, should I say, for a a whole new generation of talent coming into Wildside. And what really was, to me, the year that gave us our identity, which was 2001, and I'm really looking forward to discussing that. Very much so, and it opened the what I, I, I can literally say was a floodgate of um, reputation, and it, it only had a little bit to do with the fact we'd done the development. Something about that feud uh, and some of the other young people that were developing underneath uh, the Jimmy Raves of the world, something about that because these people were starting to get out and were starting to work for the combat zones and the, the early Ring of Honors and 
uh, and and we're getting and even Ian Rotten stuff was was hot at the time, at least from an indie standpoint in the Midwest. And there were all these little things that were going right as we started heading into 2001 into 2002. And next thing you knew, the people from all over the United States, quite literally. Uh, wanted to come in, and a goodly number of those people, uh, as John Laurinaitis told me, uh, you you develop small people, and I went, well, yeah, except of course for you know Iceberg Hot Stuff, Hernandez, Abyss, you know, blah blah blah, because um, our champions, almost with with rare exception, were big people, and our small people champions never held the belt. AJ, as a heavyweight champion, didn't hold the, hold the title for more than three months. Um, the, the smallest guy we ever put the title on was was Adam Jacobs, but that was because Jason Crossflake. But we we ended up skewing a little bit toward young talent, and that's really where our indie darling uh, thing came in, where people really started coming in once the Matt Seidels and the Deliriuses and the Darrell Clarks, and I can go on and on and on, and we will. But but that as we went into 2003, four, and then inevitably to the demise in 2005, that became our bread and butter. We were known as a work rate company and, um, but a work rate company that told a good story and, and that made us unique. Yeah. My, my favorite description was the mix between ECW and Smoky Mountain. I thought that was a pretty apt description in terms of we had some wild and crazy characters uh, but, you know, we, we kept it grounded in more of the Southern wrestling storytelling aspect. But we're out of time this week, Bill. We'll talk more about 2001 next week. I do want to look at specifically like the hardcore hell of that year, which we touched on a little bit because of the WCW stuff. That would have marked the return of AJ in Paris from WCW, as well as Freedom Fight and the other major events to kind of give fans a picture of what was going on storyline-wise. And I, I really think that'll be a great episode. Look forward to it and uh, look and in, enjoying this tremendously. And I hope the fans of Wildside and it's a surprising number of you nice people out there. So hopefully you're enjoying this as much as we're enjoying recording it. Yes, so we've gotten great feedback and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you again, Mr. Bill Barron's episode number two of NWA Wildside Chronicles is in the can. I'll talk to you next week, good sir. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, fans, there you have it. Episode two of the NWA Wildside Chronicles, part two of the Bill Barron's interview. And we are out of time. What a great edition of the Midnight Black Mass it has been. Thank you for joining us. Keep one foot in the gutter, one fist in the gold, and two horns in the air. This is the Reverend. Until next week, do the devil's work. Good night. The thing that, that lingers for me are, are obviously the people and the memories and uh, sort of on the race home as, as it began began to – either I was going to be taking another job and trying to continue Wildside or inevitably it became that Wildside was going to be shut down. But at least uh, at the nearing the end of 2004, uh, we really were simply laying out – new things and positioning ourselves as to how we would go through hardcore hell at that point. Uh, it wasn't until literally we got into 2005 that the ultimatum was laid down. And as I began negotiating contract with WWE, it became clear that Wildside, uh, if I was going to join WWE at Deep South Wrestling, Wildside was going to go out of business. So it, it sort of crept up on us at that point and made the final two shows uh, both uh, relatively back to back, but at the same time, uh, a little bit of a of a change, and uh, we were just getting started, I guess, on maximizing what had brought us to the party in 2004. For example, we had always been an area where um, the independent stars seemed to want to gra uh, gravitate, whether it was from the Midwest with Delirious and Daisy Hayes and Matt Seidel and Spider Nate Webb and various others who came in from that neck of the woods, or whether it was the people that were coming through Rudy Boy Gonzalez out of Texas, the Hernandezes, the Texas Treats, Masada, uh, and the various other nice folk that came out of there, or whether it was the groups that would come down from the Northeast with Amazing Red, the SAT, the Briscoe Brothers, the Backseat Boys, and, and a diversity of other talent out there, Osriel, uh, Walt, you know, Walter Boy Luke, Angel Dust, and John McChesney, and Kenny Doan, and, and just a, a wide variety. And, and as we went into 2004, one of the things 
we did that we hadn't done before. We'd always been that indie darling uh, kind of company in the South, which made us a little odd version of that. But we decided at our fifth anniversary show, and weirdly, our anniversary shows rarely drew. I have no idea why. We, we started doing those a couple, three years in, and and none of them really uh, drew. They They all were sort of like this show we added that was a big show that, was poorly attended and underwhelming for some reason. Uh, the anniversary shows never seemed to jump out until literally we got to this one. And this one we had uh, a fairly interesting tag team gauntlet match with a lot of key people in it, uh, some of whom I mentioned, Alder Boy Luke and Gabriel, the Tomaselli brothers, Pomp and Circumstance, Jeff Lewis and Ray Gordy, Iceberg and Tank, Kevin Quinn and Ryan Ash. Nick, uh, Nick Halen and Jay Fury, Brandon P. and Brett Anthony, Sal Renaro and Seth DeLay, Dirty Money and Phil Brown, who came in from Virginia, Don Juan and Chris Marvel of the Treats, and Skeeter Frost and Sweet Dreams. So we had a, right in that match alone, we had a strong diversity. But for the first time, we also did a Super Indie tournament, something we sort of did on our own through multi-person matches, but this was the first time we... Um, we sort of decided to identify one person and reward that person for um, the time they've invested and the uniqueness of them. Uh, and in this particular night, uh, in it, it was going to be delirious uh, in a field of competitors that included Jimmy Rave, uh, Chris Vaughn, who at the time was on television for TNA, Jarrell Clark, uh, Mr. 630, Jay Lethal, uh, Angel Dust, Walter Boy, Scott Hotshot, uh, Delirious Chase and Rance, Matt Seidel, and Rapid Edward Fast Eddie. Uh, and it, as you look at that pool of people, uh, it really was uh, a, re a strong, strong, strong super indie. And some of these matches are on my YouTube uh, page, which is NWA Wildside. So if you search NWA Wildside on YouTube, some of the things we've discussed uh, are there. And, um, and or you can use it to find other things that other people have snuck up on there. But it was, it was an interesting night that gave us a multi-person match at the end and gave us Delirious as our uh, Super Indie Tournament winner. And Delirious had been in and out, but really had not been, I don't think of it until that point, I don't believe he had won a match, quite, quite literally. And if he had, it had been a fluke or he had been involved with somebody else. But he was usually somebody that was eliminated, and we had a lot of fun with that particular character. We did tremendous vignettes with the character spouting gibberish. I think we were the first to do those. We did a takeoff on an I Love Lucy Marx Brothers routine with Mike Posey playing uh, Delirious and Delirious. We had another one with him drooling uncontrollably while it appeared he was looking at the rump of Daisy Hayes, only to find he was really looking at a wall. Um, we just did, I had a lot of fun with him and Hunter, uh, was and is an extremely talented young man. And it's no surprise to me as we look at our accomplishments that, um, that young man not only wasn't is a great wrestler, but is now the booker for ring of honor wrestling. Uh, and he concedes, uh, in our regular conversations that a goodly bit of the education that he got on how to do stuff at some level came from his time that he spent down with us. So we were doing a lot of that stuff going to the end. I wonder how long we would have kept it going. Following us, there was an NW Anarchy company that came in, but it didn't quite get started picking the ball up from us the way perhaps it could have or should have for whatever reason. Uh, it sort of stumbled a bit and became more of just uh, a southern indie rather than a destination. Um, Jerry Palmer came in, and uh, I came back after Deep South with Todd Sexton, uh, and, at, and at a different time, Dan Wilson. And uh, we were able to change the direction of the company and begin to creep it back toward what Wildside had been accomplishing. And it it became something of a destination itself with, with Gunner and Consequences Creed as two examples coming out of that. But I, you wonder if Wildside had kept going, if we hadn't hot-shotted to the end and we had just kept going where we might have ended up and who might have come in, because I don't think that that dramatic change that came after Wildside, obviously that wouldn't have occurred. And we were at the point where 
the floodgates were were wide open in terms of people wanting to come in in 2004 and into 2005. It wasn't getting to be a less desired thing. It was actually getting to be a more desired thing. And it was weird because our television coverage had diminished over the years as the industry changed. Uh, we were defined by our television that was at one time in about 50% of the country on a couple of time periods in Atlanta at one point, seen by all sorts of folk and and really helped establish a reputation. But by the time we got to 2005, rather than 50 million households, if if it was possible that 10 million households could receive it, I would have been surprised just because the networks that we used to do business had, had faded. And at the same time, cable had started to uh, its dramatic growth and the Internet had, had started to intrude. And anyone with a camera was uh, that could plug into the Internet was able to create a television show, whereas when we did it, and up and until that time, it was a fairly unique thing. Um, but we were already on a roll, so I begin to wonder if we had been able to keep going, um, how much more good work we would have been able to do uh, other than the unrealized uh, end product I ended up getting out of Deep South Wrestling. So there's a, a strong element of regret, but at the same time, you, you look back at the great people that defined Wild Side, um, you know, the A.J. Styles and the Jimmy Raves and the Dan Wilsons and the, and the Jeff Wilsons or Jeff G. Bailey's of the world and Hernandez and Abyss and, you know, and people who visited the Jay Lethals, the Kenny Dones, the Deliriouses, the Matt Seidel's. And you you begin realizing that if you try to create a list of the people who um, were touched by what we did at Wildside and touched us in in the same process by their presence and by their support, um, I don't want to say it's a who's who of professional wrestling, but by golly, it's a strong list. Um, and we were never known for the place that pushed the established star. We were never known as the place that showcased um, somebody's aging and failing career at the tail end. It, it, we'd bring in legends. We'd bring in Larry Zabisco. We'd bring in Ole Anderson, Dusty Rhodes. Uh, you know, uh, at some level, New Jack, I guess, was it something of a legend area when he started coming in, although he was relatively just part of the crew uh, when he came into us. Uh, Dory Funk Jr. coming in for the times he did. Um, Whenever we brought people of that status in, it, it more often than not, what we were doing had a lot more to do with our storyline, our talent development, than it did in uh, enhancing them. I mean, Dory Funk literally used to bring his students up, including uh, Paul London um, and uh, Adam Windsor, who was coming up on a regular basis, and the uh, the infamous referee, the Claw, uh, who's still out there uh, clawing her way to the top. So um, we had a, we had a, a a really tremendous crew, and if you were able to make it in Wildside, uh, a you you had the confidence you could make it other places, and b you did. Um, and if you didn't fit in at Wildside, it usually was because you couldn't keep up. And keeping up didn't necessarily mean that you could go like AJ Styles because you could keep up by having personality. Uh, you know, the Mr. Deliciouses of the world, J.C. North, and the Don Juans of the world were probably not our greatest workers. Uh, but at the same time, they delivered because they, they delivered character. And we developed both. We developed in-ring skill and we, just, we developed characters and personality. And that means we were teaching the entire package that creates professional wrestling because professional wrestling is an art form. It's a it's a live theater form that is so unique uh, that it confuses many uh, who don't understand it and therefore dislike it. And those who do understand it fall in love with it and have a very difficult time getting away from it because it's addictive. Um, Mike Posey refers to it as the obsessive wrestling disorder. And to some extent, uh, my degree in psychology tells me he's not far off in that because uh, I'm obsessed with professional wrestling. I transitioned out of television into it, and Wildside was um, the entity that transitioned me from being TV boy, as I used to refer to myself, into being a professional wrestling person. 
Um, by the time Wild Side was over, I was relatively out of the TV business, and I was making my living in the wrestling business. Uh, and when I went into Wild Side, it was the total opposite. Wild Side made me into a wrestling person. And um, that's not a bad thing. In fact, that's a pretty damn good thing. As I go online today, I go to Facebook as we record this, which is uh, the tail end of this is uh, third week of September. And um, there's a minor rumble as I posted episode 99, uh, whatever it was, 95 of uh, Wildside. But at the end of a wildside.com, by the way, folk can go and there's 95 episodes or at least some of them up there. And uh, I've dubbed off through 100 uh uh, Dan, your DVDs will be brought when I see you at TV. And um, the uh, there's beginning again a conversation of something we've thought about ever since Wildside ended, and that is the inevitable Wildside reunion. And uh, chiming in today were Corey Chavis, Rain Man, Scotty Wren, Jason Cross, Tank, um, and I have a feeling that if more people notice, more will, and it'll it'll start to reinforce everything we've been discussing because you're going to see a really, really strong list of folk that would enjoy um, doing it one more time. And who knows? Maybe we will. Yeah, certainly I, at this I, point, a reunion, uh, certainly at this point, seven years later, a reunion makes a little more sense to me than it did two years later. Sure. And uh, I'd be willing to take off the paint and put on a flowery shirt for a night. <laughs> but would you spike the hair? Uh, too much of it to spike. Well, too much of it in the back and not enough of it on the top to spike. So I, I have a twofold problem there. Yeah, we'd have to get Prezak back to tell bad jokes. It would be uh, it would be entertaining if nothing else. And uh, I guess maybe uh, as an outgrowth of this, as an outgrowth of the end of a wildside dot com site or my Facebook page. Um, Let's see if we can hear some from some folk, and not just our talent, but uh, an awful lot of fans uh, out there. So, Sean Waltman, get in touch. You know, so let me let me know if you think we should do this thing again. Sean was our our greatest fan at at uh, two a.m. in Milwaukee. Although <laughs> yeah. I think he walked it through Minneapolis, so I'm not really sure how, but he seemed to always see the Milwaukee feet. Never understood that. <laughs> Well, it's been a, a fantastic interview, Bill. I really enjoyed looking back. And I, as I say, once I get some of the other guys on the show and more stories go into recounting, uh, you know, maybe we'll have you back on to get your take on some things that I know this won't be the last time we see you. Um, just in closing, like one thing that, that I did want to mention, um, just, and I don't know if you can talk about it, if you can't, that's fine. But with the, the wild side being the topic of discussion, um, it was called NWA Wildside, and um, just reflections on how that related to what we did. You know, like um, there was a lot of NWA promotions. I always thought personally we were the one that stood out the most, but others might have disagreed. But regardless, um, there was a, a relationship. Well, and if they, and if, and and if they had disagreed, they would have been. And if they disagreed, they would have been wrong. Um, with the exception of some individual shows that Howard Brody did that furthered the brand at the time uh, and the early work that I was involved with with Burt Prentice in Nashville, um, what we did in Wildside had the greatest visibility and the greatest coverage of anything in the National Wrestling Alliance. And I've, I, by the way, there's a Wikipedia page for Wildside I've never put a word on. Uh, and it starts by identifying that of us. I have no idea whoever did that page, but it's it's really it's updated all the time and it's very accurate. So God bless whoever's doing it because I never had the patience or the ability. But um, I was always a fan of the National Wrestling Alliance. I grew up in the state of Florida watching Eddie Graham's promotion, and my favorite feud historically was Dory Funk Jr. Jun, uh, Junior versus Jack Briscoe, which I got to see live one time in a 60-minute Broadway in uh, the fine city of Atlanta at, at I believe, uh, the, either the Civic Center in Minnesota or a Minnesota Auditorium downtown, um, one of only two major wrestling shows pre-TNA, WWE, that I ever saw, the other one being at the Omni um, with a main event of the Superstar versus Tommy Rich in a cage and uh, Abdullah the Butcher versus Tor Kamada with the great Mephisto managing, which, you know, you can't go wrong with that kind of shit. Anyway, um 
but we we were the flagship that we honored the champions a lot of the titles uh were defended we we were a showcase for um at in particular the uh the NWA junior title and the NWA tag team titles as uh we both featured and created Bad Attitude, who were multi-time champions. We featured the Rock and Roll Express in one of their nine million runs as champion and put the titles on them. Um, heck, we even had uh, three count as champions for a half a minute, but we also had the new Heavenly Bodies come in as champions, Disturbing Behavior come in as champions. Um, and that was just one of it. The national title changed hands frequently and was relatively uh, recreated in our area. Um, and you can go on and on. And uh, we intended to have the world champion in more, but we had some minor issues with that. Uh, Steve Carino uh, got lost on his way to the arena. And, uh, of course, we, we told the story of Jeff Jarrett and A.J. Styles. Um, but we did have Sabu. So uh, we, we got a champion in at some point, at least. But we, we really tried to progress the brand. And I think through the mutual association, the brand benefited and we were able to benefit from utilizing the brand quite literally. The first major angle we did in Wildside was me taking over with the NWA from NCW The uh, and the NWA was a heel. And the greatest faction we ever created is the NWA elite that will probably from now on be simply called the elite because that's what they always have been. The team managed by Jeff G. Bailey always the team was always a proving ground um, and it's amazing the kind of feeling those that have even been in just that faction within Wildside and then eventually Anarchy as it perpetuated um, that was for years called the NWA elite um, how pe- how many people went through that who all was really part of it and how many of them have gone on to something else and you know people have have license plates like that, tattoos with that on them. Um, that's how special some of this stuff was. Um, uh, and I, I, I think, however, the NWA changes going forward, um, we helped create its greatest modern history, at least within the last 14 years. Um, you know, us and TNA did the most for the NWA brand during that period of time without exception and us and TNA were somewhat tied together uh, during that period of time, so maybe that synergy helped a little bit. Um, so that's that's my thoughts on the NWA. Um, but my other thought on the NWA is the same as another story in the NWA. Jerry Jarrett was brought into the NWA by Eddie Graham, his mentor, and Jerry, Jerry Jarrett was in it for years and has a tremendous respect for the NWA, was the man with Jeff Jarrett who made the decision to bring it into TNA because he respects and honors the brand. But at one time, it became difficult for him to work within the NWA as it had changed. Something else was happening. Jim Crockett relatively owned it, uh, even though there were four or five other members. Crockett was doing whatever he wanted the way he wanted to do it, and the other key members, um, Bill Watts had sold to him, Fritz Von Erich had relatively gone out of business, and other people had been shut down by Vince McMahon. So there was only some fleeting indies out there And Jerry Jarrett was one of the last, and he couldn't get the world champion in, so he quit. No matter how important it was to him, it wasn't important enough to impact on his business. And so he went into business with Vern Gagne in the AWA, tried to buy the company, balked at um, paying a bunch of money and having to hire Greg Gagne, and said, screw that. And he went and created USWA with Max Andrews, had a short run and successful one with him when that stopped working. He went back to Memphis. So my attitude on the NWA today probably is is that I'll uh, pack up and go back to Memphis. So um, and I and I but I'll look back as I look at Wildside and go, eh, we created history, not just for ourselves, but for a, a variety of things, and for definitely for the all, all the people involved. Um, I don't think anybody came out of a of a reasonable run with Wildside without being a better wrestler and in many in many situations, if not most of them, a better person. Yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. I think that was one thing we got a lot of flack from some of the diehard, what I would call NWA Trekkies, who tend to post on their message boards. You know, uh, seem like nice enough folks, but fairly delusional in some cases. 
Um, my, one, of my, uh, one of my great memories is, is frequently we were voted as the promotion of the year by the uh, Virginia people. But it was always like a tie between NWA Virginia and us. I always thought that was entertaining. So, <laughs> even, even, even when other people felt they needed to honor themselves, they, they sort of threw us in just going, wait, well, see, we're, we're as good as them. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to take that as a, as a form of flattery at, at that level. I, I think that. <laughs> I remember other people brought Wild Side in to feud with them. We really never did that on our end. I never really had an interest in doing that. We created our own feuds. Wild Side was brought to Combat Zone Wrestling for a short run feud. Wild Side went down and did a hell of a setup for what could have been a tremendous feud in Florida if Howard Brody and the rest of his stupid ass crew with Ron Neely hadn't screwed the damn thing up after we had nuclear heat in the frickin' building. We actually had wrestlers fighting us, thinking we were doing everything we were doing. It was awesome. <laughs> and then they all recover and stand there bleeding, and each of them cuts a promo and. I just wanted to shoot someone. Thank goodness Howard Brody was punched that night. <laughs> yeah, there, Somebody there were a lot of done invasions. Uh, the IWA Mid South did an invasion angle too, so that that was really cool, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, people identified they wanted Wild Side to come to them. We really never turned that around. We, you know, we we did some stuff with Bang with Dory, but never a feud. We would just bring them in and recognize them. We recognized other folk. We usually recognized where people came from when they came in. But we, we were more, as an entity, we were desired. It was it was a yeah, an easy feud to bring in a wild side crew. Um, that's why I told my, my crew periodically they'd go to a show and somebody that was a baby face in wild side would go to a show in the same state and try to be a heel, and I'd get pissed off at that person. Uh, and I'd get pissed off at them. Because I would say, did you look around the locker room and see any other wild side guys? And that person would go, yeah, there were four or five guys. I said, then you're at a, you're at a wild side show. You're you're there, and you need to maintain the integrity of what you're doing. And if you're freaking baby face here, you're a baby face there. Now, if you go to another state and you go to you go way down the road, you can do whatever the hell you want to be. But you don't screw with what we've established here simply because it's convenient on that night. You recognize that your storyline progresses outside of that little teeny building that holds 200 people in Cornelia, Georgia. That doesn't define you. You're defined by some a much bigger universe than that, and you got to respect it. Yeah, uh, that that was a, a point that I still staunchly agree with. When we have you know shows on television, you need to. If you're anywhere where people can see the television in particular, you need to be maintaining consistency there. But and in, in any event, you, you've wrapped up thoughts on the NWA, Wild Side as a whole. Anything else you want to put out there for the people, uh, the, the promote just, your website, just, plugs, just, whatever? Just please go to wildside.com. Um, and, you know, if if you ever want to, you know, give me feedback, uh, my email is showbis, S-H-O-W-B-I-S, as in Sam. The Z was gone when I tried to get it nine million years ago. S-H-O-W-B-I-S at AOL.com. Um, so any other questions I haven't answered or any other greater interest, who knows if people remind me of stuff I've forgotten, and golly, almost anyone could. Uh, maybe we'll do more of this, or maybe we'll end up heading toward that reunion and uh, see who we can drag out of their uh, out of their easy chair to uh, come in and show that they can still go. I, I will definitely be a part of it, and thank you again, Bill, for joining the show. We look very much forward to having you back on the program when the time comes, and we know it will as we move upward and onward with more NWA Wildside Chronicles. Thank you very much for joining us, and I hope you have a great one.